you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we've been in the middle of a sermon series and called Stories That Change Our Lives. We're looking at the parables or the short stories that Jesus told that helped to change the lives of his first century listeners and will change our life as well if we will listen with an open heart. So I would encourage you to turn in that Red Pew Bible to the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 to 32, to see how this, these three stories uh, can change our lives. This is a, a three-for-one sermon. You're going to get three parables in one sermon. Aren't you glad you came, right? I love the two-for-one deal, but the three-for-one is unheard of. So we're so glad you're here. You're going to get three parables in one sermon. But before I read God's Word and preach God's Word, let's call upon His Holy Spirit again to guide us in the, in the reading and the hearing and the preaching of his holy word. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much that Luke took the time to interview those who heard Jesus speak. He took the time, inspired by your Holy Spirit, to write down these stories that Jesus told, stories that changed the lives of those who heard them, and we know by your Spirit can change our life today. So God, I pray that as we read these familiar stories that you might speak afresh and anew to us, that we might be changed at the reading and the hearing and the preaching of your holy word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. Through your son's precious name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 15, again, uh, in that Red Pew Bible, it can be found on page 1112. 1112 of the Red Pew Bible. I would highly encourage you to take out that Red Pew Bible and follow along as I read this morning's text and make reference to the text throughout the sermon. Listen to God's Word. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So... Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after that, that, that one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, She calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods, the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look. These many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead, and he's alive. He was lost and is found. Here ends the reading of God's Word. As the prophet Isaiah tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Have you ever lost anything that's precious to you? I remember in the spring break of 2022, my family decided to go to the Arches National Park near Moab, Utah, and uh, we woke up real early. In fact, I think I have a picture I want to show you of us in in front of that famous arch. We had to wake up before the crack of dawn to get that photo. It was a lot of fun. We went from there to the uh, Canyonlands National Park that's not too far away. In fact, I've got a picture of Sarah there in the Canyonlands National Park in this narrow canyon that we hiked. And there's actually an arch at the Canyonland National Park that you can walk on. I've got a picture of that with little John in orange. He's hard to see. He's wearing his long horn sweatshirt there. And, uh, and, and, he, and he's able to walk on that, that big arch, which is amazing. And to give you some perspective of how large this arch is, if I've got a selfie here I want to show you. Right there, that's me next to that big arch. It was an amazing trip. We had a wonderful time. And after this three-mile hike, we came back to our parking to the parking lot, and we started to drive away in the suburban. And I was trying to get my phone in order to tune it to the right song for a playlist I had on my phone. I couldn't find my phone. I checked my backpack; it wasn't there. I checked the floor of the car to see maybe it dropped out as I sat down. It wasn't there. I was in a panic. I turned that Suburban around in a really tight road. I did a 180, turned the car and went straight back to the parking lot thinking, oh no, I've lost my phone. It fell out of my pocket amidst that three-mile hike. What am I going to do? Well, another car was coming at me and I want to make sure they didn't take it. So I honked my horn. I unrolled my window. I said, hey, did you see an iPhone along the trail? The man shook his head said, no. I said, okay. I drove as fast as I could, thinking I'm going to have to hike or run three miles back up that trail to to that spot where I took that picture you just saw of me with that selfie. That's the last time I remember using my phone. Before I ran up that trail, I remembered, oh yes, I did go to the restroom before I, I hiked that trail. Maybe it's in that smelly National Park restroom. So I walked in and there it was on the floor and I said, praise Jesus! And the man in the restroom looked at me like I was crazy, but I didn't care. There was much rejoicing in the finding of my phone. Have you ever lost something that's important to you? And there, if you have, you know what I'm talking about. If you lose your wallet and you find it, you're, you're rejoicing. If you found, lost your purse and you find it. If you lose an earbud or an iPhone, you're rejoicing. Have you ever lost a child? I have to admit, before we went to Moab, uh, uh, Utah, in uh, the President's Day weekend of 2019, we decided to go skiing in Taos, New Mexico. Now, I am the worst skier among my family because I played basketball in high school. And every uh, Christmas break when my youth group was going off on a ski trip, I had to play in a holiday basketball tournament. So I never skied until I met Sarah. And she grew up skiing. She's a wonderful skier. She loves to ski. She's taught all three of our kids how to ski, and they're all better than me. And so when we went to Taos to go skiing, uh, our two daughters decided to ski together because they're, they're fast. And, and John, who skis like a bullet straight down, uh, skied with Sarah because she's fast and she can keep up with him. I can't keep up with anybody. 
Well, this Sarah is skiing down with uh, John, who skis straight down like a bullet. He doesn't do any of this swerving, just straight down with no poles at the age of nine. She lost him. There's points in the mountain in Taos where uh, trails converge, and a black diamond goes this way, and a blue goes that way. And he took the black diamond, and she took the blue, and she lost her son. Our, our only son, whom we love, who did not have a cell phone. We didn't know what we were going to do. Sarah began to pray, oh, Lord, please help us find our son. ding ling ling the phone rings. She pulls out her phone, and it's a 210 number from San Antonio, where my wife grew up. She said, hello? And this kind woman on the other end says, are you Sarah's mom? Yes, I am. Oh, well, he's down here at the base of the mountain. We found him. We'll wait for you until he gets here. She goes, oh, thank you so much, and answered prayer. She gets down to the base of the mountain and introduces herself, and she says, hey, I noticed you had a 210 number. Are you from San Antonio? I said, yes, we are. She said, oh, I grew up in San Antonio. We now live in Amarillo, but I, I love San Antonio. And she said, oh, what are you doing in Amarillo? And my wife said, well, my, my husband's the pastor, one of the pastors at First Presbyterian Church in Amarillo. And the woman said, no, really, that's amazing. We go to Redeemer Presbyterian Church in San Antonio. And my wife said, that's amazing. My cousin John Browning goes to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. She said, the woman said, this is amazing. We're in the small group with John and Lauren Browning every Wednesday night. Talk about answered prayer. Of all the people that can help find our lost son on the mountain of Taos skiing on President's Day weekend, where there are hundreds if not thousands of people on the mountain, he chose the other Presbyterian family on the mountain that day <laughs> who's, who are in a small group with my wife's cousin. Talk about a small world. There was much rejoicing at the base of the mountain in Taos that day. I got a picture of John and Sarah I want to show you. He was so happy to find his mom. Amen? Have you ever lost something that's precious to you? When you find it, oh, there's such rejoicing. My friends, that's what these three parables are really all about. Notice the progression that we see in this, this text this morning. The first, there's a man, a shepherd, who has a hundred sheep, and he loses one. Now, in the first century, if you owned five to 15 sheep, that would be normal. To have a hundred sheep or more meant you were quite wealthy. And so to lose one sheep while a loss might just be part of doing business, right? It wouldn't be that big a deal. And yet, the shepherd loves this lost sheep so much that he leaves the 99 in the open field to find that one lost sheep because every sheep matters to this shepherd. And the next story, we get the story of the woman who's lost one of her 10 coins, probably all that she owns. She's not a very wealthy person, so when you lose one of 10 coins, you're going to be desperate to find that one lost coin. So she turns up her house, sweeps everywhere, and finally finds it, and there's much rejoicing in the finding of that one lost coin. And then we have the story, the most popular story of all these three parables, of the man who had two sons, just two sons. And his youngest son tells his dad, Dad, I want my stuff. Your stuff is more important than you, to me. Kenneth Bailey, the great New Testament scholar, writes about what an insult this would have been to the father in the first century. He writes, in Middle Eastern culture, to ask for the inheritance while the father is still alive is to wish him dead. Dad, you're as good as dead to me. I'd rather have your stuff than you. A traditional Middle Eastern father can only respond one way. He's expected to refuse and drive the boy out of the house with verbal, if not physical, blows. When the first century audience heard Jesus tell this story, they thought, oh, that son's got a beating coming. But that's not what the father does. No, this gracious, generous, loving father gives his son what he asks for. Why would he do that? I mean, in an agrarian society, in order for the son to get his third, which is what the younger son would have been entitled to, a third of the family's property, he would have actually had to sell some land. Land that had most likely been in that family for generations. It would have been very costly, very shameful to sell a third of your estate to give his son what he asks for so that he might spend the money in a far land. Why does the father give his younger son so much? I believe it's because the father loves his son so much. For as we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, let's read this together. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, the Greek word for world there is cosmos. We get the English word cosmos from that. It means all of creation, all that God has created, you and me. For God so loved all of us that he gave. In his generous love for us, he gave his one and only son who is without sin, who died on a cross to pay the price for all of our sins so that we could be reconciled to God, that we might be in a right relationship with God and understand that God just doesn't love us this much. He loves us this much. Unconditionally, sacrificially, eternally. And God loves us not because we're good. No, God loves us because he's chosen to love us. As Orlando read so beautifully just a moment ago in in Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses tells the people in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 8, he says, the Lord your God has chosen you, speaking to Israel, to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it's because... The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you because he loves you. He's chosen to love you. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore. He's already shown the full extent of his love that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And there's no greater love than the unconditional, sacrificial, eternal love of Jesus. Yes, the Lord loves us because he loves us. And Jesus is trying to explain to these self-righteous Pharisees and scribes who are questioning who Jesus hangs out with that God loves us because he loves us unconditionally, sacrificially. And if God loves everyone, shouldn't we? You know, the, this parable, we often call the parable the prodigal son. In fact, in my Bible, that's what the little title that the editors have put in later, the parable of the prodigal son. It'd probably be more appropriate to call it the the parable of the loving father because he's really the hero of the story. Because the fact is there's two sons and both have sin in their lives. The first son, well, his sin's pretty obvious. Uh, We can see that, uh, you know, he asks for his father to give him his inheritance before his father's even passed away, saying, Dad, your stuff is more important to me than you are. And he goes away off into the far country where the pagans lived, where sin abounded, and he wastes all of the money, the inheritance he had, on loose living. But thankfully, thankfully, while he's feeding the pigs, the most menial job a young Jewish boy would be asked to do, something that he would never want to do because they believe pigs were such dirty animals that they wouldn't even eat pork. Thankfully, I'm not Jewish. I love bacon, right, Orlando? Give me some bacon anytime. It makes everything better. But this Jewish teenage boy, most scholars believe he's a teenager because he's not married. He's having to feed these pigs, and he's so hungry, he longs to eat what the pigs are eating. And then in verse 17 to 20, we read, but when he came to himself at the nadir, the low point of his life, he finally comes to himself and has an epiphany on aha moment. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy that he be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I'm no longer worthy to be called one of your sons. Was he ever worthy to be called one of his father's sons? Are any of us worthy to be called a child of God? We're never worthy. No, God loves us because he loves us. And this prodigal son will not realize and understand the grace and the love of his father until he sees his father face to face. So listen to what happens in verse 20. And he, the son, the prodigal son, arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. This is the same Greek word for compassion that we find in Luke 10, where the Good Samaritan, as we saw last week, had compassion on the man who had been 
robbed and beaten and left for dead. When the father saw him and felt compassion, compassion, love, great desire for, not condemnation, not judgment. And while he was still far, a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Notice that the younger son doesn't even say a word before his father does all these things. His father does the, well, the humiliating thing for an older man of his age. He pulls his robe up and he runs to hug and kiss his son who was lost but is now found. He doesn't wait for his son's explanation. No, he's just so in love with his son that he, he, he rejoices at his return. And if our father rejoices at one sinner who repents, shouldn't we as well? Sadly, the Pharisees and the scribes in the first century weren't rejoicing at the sinners who were repenting and coming to Jesus, were they? Look again at Luke 15, verses 1 to 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now table fellowship in the first century was kind of a big deal. Who you ate with was who you were willing to associate or affiliate with. And and so it showed that you approved of them. And for Jesus to eat with tax collectors of all people, people who were viewed as, well, as heretics, as traitors, as cheats, as thieves, to eat with tax collectors and sinners was not good for Jesus' reputation. But Jesus doesn't care, does he? In fact, this isn't the first time that Jesus has gotten in trouble for hanging out with sinners. If you read all of the Gospel of Luke, you'll see that in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32, we read these words. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, better known as Matthew to you and me, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me and leaving everything, Levi rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. Levi, or better known as Matthew, is so excited that Jesus has invited him to follow him that he left his tax booth, he left his business, and he has a party with all his friends. But the only friends a tax collector had were fellow tax collectors because nobody likes tax collectors in the first century. They were considered to be traitors. They were working for the occupying Roman government, collecting taxes, and they were known to charge more than what was required. They were known to be thieves and criminals. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Jesus didn't come to this earth simply to hang out in a holy huddle, did he? No, he was very intentional about reaching out to sinners like Matthew, the tax collector. As we think about the first parable we looked at, the parable of the sowers and the seeds, we'll have to recognize that Matthew was, well, he was like one of those fertile soils where the seed, the word of God, was planted and produced a hundred times that which was planted because Matthew, we know, becomes an apostle who then writes the Gospel of Matthew. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see at the very beginning of that Gospel, there's a genealogy that lists many sinners. Jesus' ancestry was filled with many sinners, like David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. And Solomon came from that marriage that David had with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Yes, Matthew was a sinner, and he knew it, and he was so grateful that Jesus called him to follow him. And and there should have been great rejoicing that Matthew would repent from his sin and come and follow Jesus, but that's not what the Pharisees and the scribes did. They stood in judgment of Jesus because he was spending time with sinners and tax collectors. You know, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that Matthew writes that we are the salt of the earth. And salt back then was a preservative that helped preserve the meat and was also something that brought flavor as it does for us today as well. And to be called salt means that we're called to get back to what God originally intended when he created everything and it was very good, he said. We're called to help preserve God's original intention of creation and we're supposed to make things better. But salt can't do its job 
if it stays inside a salt shaker. It's got to get out among the sinners and the broken and the fallen and those who are far from God. And that's what Jesus was doing. But the scribes and Pharisees only stood in judgment of Jesus. As Jesus said in Luke 5, 32, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Of course, the truth is we're all sinners in need of God's grace, aren't we? One of the things I love about being Presbyterian is that every time we have a, a worship service, we always have a, a prayer of confession, as we had earlier, a, a corporate prayer of confession, recognizing that we are all sinners. None of us are perfect. We all need God's grace. And as those who have received God's grace, we want to be, be instruments of God's grace to others by reaching out to those who are far from God, not staying in a holy huddle, but going out into the world in our places of work, in our neighborhood, in our social circles, and meeting and interacting and loving people who don't yet know how much God loves them. And that's what Jesus was doing, hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. But the scribes and the Pharisees, they fail to rejoice. Even though Jesus makes it clear at the end of the first two parables, there's great rejoicing in heaven, when one sinner repents, there should have been great rejoicing that Jesus was with these tax collectors and these sinners, and they were willing to come and repent and come to Jesus. But that's not the response of the Pharisees and the scribes. They stand in judgment of Jesus. When we have a friend or a coworker or a neighbor or even a family member who sins, are we quick to condemn them? Or do we pray for them, that they might repent and come home to Jesus? Rather than rejoicing that these sinners are coming to Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees are standing in judgment of Jesus, ultimately because they want justice, like the older brother in our story. Tim Keller writes in this great book, if you don't have it, it's called The Prodigal God, Recovering the Heart of the Christian Faith. Uh, it's the story of, it go, he does a great exposition of the story, this parable. He writes this, at the end of the story, the elder brother has an opportunity to truly delight the father by going into the feast, but his resentful refusal shows that the father's happiness had never been his goal. When the father reinstates the younger son to the diminishment of the older son sharing the estate, the elder brother's heart is laid bare. He does everything he can to hurt and to resist his father. Both sons in this story sin. The older son sins in his loose living. The younger son sins in his pride. And the fact that he doesn't honor his father and go into the celebration to rejoice that his brother who was lost is now found. You know, in his pride, all he can think about, in his selfishness, all he can think about is how much that fattened calf just cost me. You see, the fattened calf was a special animal that would only be used usually for religious ceremonies. And when you killed the fattened calf, it meant you would invite dozens and dozens of people to the celebration. And now he's having to bankroll this feast because his younger brother, who just spent all of his inheritance on wasteful living, is now here. And rather than celebrating that his brother who was lost is now found, he's standing in condemnation of his younger brother because he wants justice. When we see someone who's sinning, do we want justice? Or we pray for repentance, that they might come home to Jesus? Are we willing to invite them to come home to Jesus? You know, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes that when a brother or sister is found in sin, we should seek to restore them gently. He says, brother, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You should come to them. Talk to them one-on-one -on -one about their sin and pray that they might turn from their sin and come back to God and come home to the family of faith to join us in the celebration of God's amazing grace and love. Keller wisely writes at the end of this book what the elder brother should have done. He writes, this is what the elder brother in the parable should have done. This is what a true elder brother would have done. He would have said, Father, my younger brother has been a fool and now his life is in ruins, but I will go look for him and bring him home. And if the inheritance is gone as I expect, I'll bring him back into the family at my expense. A good older brother would have loved his brother as much as his father loves his son. Because when you love someone, you love what they love. 
And what God loves more than anything is us. Humanity, people, are the crown of his creation. All of us who have been created in the very image of God. Yes, when you love someone, you love what they love. I'll be honest with you, I grew up in Midland having to attend the Nutcracker every Christmas because my sister was in it, and I've never really liked ballet. But when my two daughters, Hannah and Elizabeth, did ballet, I loved ballet. (laughs) Because when you love someone, you love what they love. When we love God in gratitude for his love for us, we should love what he loves, which is our neighbor. The first most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, Jesus says, to love your neighbor as yourself. When we have a friend or a coworker or even a family member who strays from the faith, do we condemn them or do we pray for them? Do we reach out to them to let them know that no matter what they've done, God still loves them and he will welcome them if they will simply come home to him? It's like the good elder brother. We should be willing to go out to those who are lost. After all, isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus left the glory of heaven, humbled himself, and became a baby in a lowly manger. He grew up among us, he taught us, he healed us, and ultimately he died on a cross as the perfect atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. And then he conquered sin and death on that third day when he rose from the dead. And he invites everyone, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our friends, Jesus invites all of us to come to him. And he wants us to extend that invitation to others. Salt doesn't do a lot of good if it stays in the salt shaker. We've got to go out as Jesus has come out to us to invite us to follow him. May we all seek to reach out to those who are far from God today. Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, as we see in these three parables, there is much rejoicing in one sinner who repents. Although we all recognize that we are all sinners in need of repentance, that none of us are perfect. And so we rejoice as well when one sinner repents. And we know that there are people in our lives who do not yet know you, who are far from you. For whatever reason, they have rejected you, they have wandered away from the faith, or they never knew you at all. So God, I pray that like the good elder brother that Jesus has been to all of us, who left the comfort and the glory of heaven and humbled himself to be born as a baby in a lowly manger, we might be willing to take whatever journey is necessary to reach out to those who are far from you, to extend your grace and love to them, to let them know there's a God who loves them no matter what they've done. There's a God who loves them so much that he was willing to die for them and rise again for them. They can have eternal life and a new life if they will simply turn to him, repent, and believe the good news. Oh God, help us to be an instrument of your grace this day and every day. Your sons and me praying, all God's people said, amen.